Aloha, and welcome back to Think Tech Hawaii's uh, Ruderman Roundtable. I'm Senator Russell Ruderman from the Puna District on the Big Island, and I'm here hosting, we host a series of discussions on environmental and good government issues. My guest today is Stuart Coleman. Thank you for joining us, Stuart. My pleasure. Stuart's the Hawaii manager of the Surfrider Foundation and author of Eddie Would Go, Fierce Heart, and his new book, Eddie Aikau, Hawaiian Hero. His books have won the Cady's Award for Literature and several writing fellowships. Originally from Charleston, North Carolina, Stewart has lived in Hawaii for over 20 years and taught at Punahou and Iolani School, Schools, the University of Hawaii Manoa and East West Center. The Surfrider Foundation is a national and island leader, leader in coastal protection, policy education, water quality, low impact development and community empowerment. Uh, so Surfrider to me is one of the, the environmental organizations that protects our oceans and our beaches and our shores. And thank you for the work that you yeah, do. Yeah, thank you. It's a pleasure. So, before we get started, I, I think you're the first author I've had on the show <laughs> and I'm very, very impressed. You've uh, given me a copy of your book, Eddie Would Go, and your new book, Eddie I Cow, Hawaiian Hero. Will you tell me a little bit about the books? Yeah. Uh, when I first moved here, I got a job teaching at Punahou and it just seemed everything pointed to Eddie Aikau. This uh, teacher, Marion Lyman Mercero, was working on an article about Eddie, and she had been on the Hokulea with Eddie, one of the last people to, to mm. see him. And she told me this story, and she's like, do you think there's a story there, enough for an article? <laughs> and I'm thinking to myself, this is one of the greatest stories I've ever heard. Uh, so, but I thought, oh, I can't tell this story. Uh, you know, I just arrived here. But years went by, and some of the elders who were involved with voyaging started to get older and pass on. I'm like, someone has to write this book. So I became friends with the Aikau family and, and, uh, and their extended ohana, surfers, lifeguards, and sailors. And just one thing led to another. And finally, after four years, I, I produced Eddie We Go. Oh, good for you. That's yeah. great. I love when people write books. It's so yeah. so great. Lost art <laughs> sometimes. Yeah, just trying to get people back into reading. So tell me about Surfrider Foundation's work in Hawaii and across the country. Yeah, yeah we have uh, Surfrider Foundation just celebrated its 30th anniversary uh, a couple of years ago. And we have about 85 to 90 chapters across the country. And we have five chapters in Hawaii. Really? Yeah. So we have one um, for Oahu, one for Maui, one for Kauai, and then two on the Big Island um, in Hilo and Kona. Mm. Yeah. Nice. And basically, we um, are dedicated to the preservation and enjoyment of the world's ocean, waves, and beaches. Um, and we do that through what I call care, um, conservation, activism, research, and education. And uh, our biggest issues are kind of water quality and um, beach access and then plastic pollution. Mm -hmm. Yeah. What about uh, some of the unique issues when it comes to surf riders this year, especially as it relates to Hawaii? Yeah, uh, Hawaii is you know the birthplace uh, of surfing, and so it was very important to be represented out here and uh, to have you know a presence because there's just so much pressure to develop our coastlines, and so kind of following what John Kelly started with Save Our Surf, um, Surf Rider Foundation you know, is representing, our goal is 100% cover, coverage of all our beaches um, and protection. And it's done through like this extended uh, activist network. And so it really is a grassroots organization, people who are just passionate about protecting their coastal areas and uh, making sure that there's access and that the water's clean and that the beaches aren't polluted. So we do a lot of beach cleanups. And for Hawaii, I think some of the particular issues, you know, are we have the highest number of cesspools in the country. Um, and so we, that was one of the campaigns that we launched a couple of years ago when we were at the Capitol pushing for bills mm -hmm. and, uh, you know, appreciate support uh, like uh, you and, and many other senators gave. And we were able to pass a bill that gives tax breaks for homeowners to, uh, you know, to... To convert. Yeah, yeah. exactly. To convert 10, a cesspool 000. to a septic system. Exactly. Right so, you know, cesspools are just basically a hole in the ground. And so this gives them money to, you know, qualifying houses that are within 200 feet of a body of water to upgrade their system so it doesn't leach out 
because believe it or not, in some of the most pristine areas in Kauai, you think the one of the least developed islands, uh, it's, you know, some of these streams and beach areas are 100% chronically polluted. Mm -hmm. It's just amazing. I mean, we were astounded because they're such beautiful islands, but there's so many cesspools, you know, that are built right near the stream. And if it's a heavy rain event, it just goes right into the stream and not mm -hmm. to the ocean. Yeah, so we've been working with the Department of Health and their Clean Water Branch to post warning signs and also to um, just do better public notification so people who are going to the beach know that, you know, after a major rain, you never go out within 24 to 48 hours, depending on how serious the rains are, especially that first flush. It hasn't rained in a while. And that's what we call the brown water advisory? Yes, exactly. And why is it, why is it important not to go out when that happens? Because there, there's so many different pathogens in the water, you know, just like from the cesspools, but then there's, you know, the waste from animals, um, domestic and feral, you know, feral cats are a huge issue um, because they uh, cause a disease called toxoplasmosis, mm -hmm. which is really harmful to the monk seals. Um, oh. And so, yeah, and that we have, the monk seals are one of the most endangered marine mammals in the world, only 1,100 left. And so we have one of the highest feral cat, cat populations as well, which was astounding to learn. So the toxoplasmosis survives from the cat into its you know, feces, into it, the stream, into the ocean? Yeah. Really? Yeah. But then you also have all the, the pesticides, all the oil, the gas leakage, um, everything in the streets, basically, mm. just no gets, goes to the storm drains and directly into the ocean, yeah. So we really caution people not to go in the water after a major rain event. You know, at the recent conservation conference, I attended a workshop about uh, coral bleaching and corals being in, in threatened in general. And I think that runoff such as this is one of the stressors yeah. on, our, on our corals, right? Exactly. There's, there are several. But it's and there's a bill that uh, um, Senator Sparrow and others are uh, putting forth um, for oxybenzone. Mm -hmm. You know, right. the, 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 the stuff the in sunscreen, sunscreen, the right. chemical sunscreen, which has proved to be really, really... Um, toxic for the reefs mm -hmm. and as it helps with you know aids in coral bleaching um and corals are the you know the kind of uh right we call them the rainforest of the ocean and that they just you know they bring so much life and fish to the area and without them we'd be in trouble so we're you know encouraging a ban on oxybenzone so recommending more zinc based or mineral based um sunblocks mm -hmm. over these sunscreens with oxybenzone and on that subject, has, the, has research shown that zinc and titanium-based uh, sunscreens are relatively safe compared to the oxybenzone ones? Yeah, there's still more research to be done, um, and you know we're not quite sure, but health-wise, it's better, and for the health of the reefs, it's the reefs. definitely better. It is. Yeah, so I mean, it is more than just an environmental issue, it, it's, a, it's a health issue. Okay. Um, so we're trying to... Again, it's just information and education, trying to get people aware, because we just want them to be healthy and our reefs to be healthy. Good. Yeah. What are some of the other big campaigns you've uh, been involved in in Hawaii? Yeah, so others are, we have our Rise Above Plastics campaign. Mm. And so we worked um, and helped pass uh, with a coal, big coalition of groups um, the, the, in the, at the county levels, the ban on plastic, plastic bags, mm -hmm. yeah. And then um, at the state level, a um, year and a half ago, we um, passed the um, smoke-free beaches and parks oh, bill, right. which is great because we do beach cleanups around the islands and cigarette every month. Butts, right? and yeah. Cigarette yeah. butts are the number one. Yeah, so we had a campaign, um, uh, you know, that you know, no butts on, on the beach, um, basically. And that was successful, right? It yeah, passed statewide, yeah, it passed right? statewide, and we were the first state to do so. And now oh. other states are scrambling to, to do the yeah. same thing. So we've been a leader in, in many ways. We were the first state to ban plastic bags county by county and the first state to create a smoke-free beaches and parks bill. And Wonderful. We're doing some, some good stuff, so it's exciting. Well, you're giving me a lot of help because sometimes I think that nothing much changes. <laughs> exactly. You've actually achieved some very important successes yeah. that made our, our world a better place. Yeah. Well, it's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a group effort. You know, you could, this is one of the things that I realized when I came into this position. I was like, okay, there's no way. You know, some of the environmental groups were fighting amongst each other. We're like, we'll never get anything done. We have to form a big coalition. And, okay. and it's been effective, and it's great, because sometimes people, we were talking about this 
think of environmental groups as being just a pain, you know, and they're mm -hmm. trying to ban this and ban that, but we're just trying to make, you know, people healthier and create less litter and um, better, you know, environment for our kids and, and everyone to enjoy. So I know that one of the issues you've been working on because it's been an issue on uh, my island, the big island, is trying to address styrofoam, yeah. you know, single-use styrofoams. To me, it's very similar to what we saw with the plastic bag bans, where uh, the same sorts of people oppose it, and people come out and say, well, we can't possibly do that here, mm -hmm. and people here aren't conscious enough to make that change, and, and or, or it's too expensive for the businesses. Yeah, yeah. Now, we saw with the plastic bag change that none of that was true. Right. We have made the change. It's not no businesses that went under. Mm -hmm. As a result, the sky didn't fall. Yeah. Do you think the styrofoam push is a, analogous to that? Is it going to be the same thing? I think it's the exact same thing. It is funny, like, changing little habits can just seem so monumental to people. You know, there's like, no way we can do it. I can't do it without styrofoam. And it's like, yet your parents and your grandparents <laughs> going all the way back, <laughs> you know, in history did fine without it. And, yeah. and so will we, you know. And we try to tell people that, you know, it's, it's going to happen because it has to happen. Mm -hmm. You know, styrofoam is one of the most toxic, the least recycled forms of plastic ever made. Mm -hmm. And we see it on the beaches, it's one of the most littered forms of plastic. It floats so it looks like food, so all kinds of sea creatures from sea turtles to seabirds ingest it, and it gets stuck in their systems. And uh, yeah, it's just, you know, it's, it's a very toxic material, um, especially when there are compostable alternatives here. Um, and every distributor across Hawaii has them. Mm -hmm. They're more expensive, but the more we do of these, the you know, more we sell that's of these, right. the less they'll cost. And if we can make them here, mm -hmm. that's the goal. Then we'll be truly sustainable. But also the other thing is, you know, just having reusable plates. Um, sometimes mm -hmm. we, I think our parents really did know best, you know. <laughs> we need to go back to, we have this throwaway culture that was invented in the 70s. Mm -hmm. And now we just don't even think, we just throw away everything. I mean, yeah. cameras are disposable now. Like, who would have ever thought that? Um, and it's, it's almost this idea, this illusion that there are unlimited resources. We can mm -hmm. continue doing this forever. And I think we're coming to the end of that consciousness where people are starting to realize, no, you can't just throw away everything. <laughs> And it's funny because when, when people think about, oh, there, there's plenty of room on the earth to throw away stuff and use things up, I think the ocean is sort of the last frontier of that. People think the ocean can really absorb everything yes. we can ever put in. Exactly. And it's really not true. It's yeah. limited just like the land is and yeah. stuff stays around and, exactly. and does damage. There was a, a study um, that was just published in Science Magazine and said, and current trends, the way the plastic production, and, and we're talking about single-use plastics, things mm -hmm. we use for 15 minutes and then throw away and they last in the environment you know, for hundreds of years, um, that with, by 2050, there will be more plastic pollution in the ocean than fish mm. by weight. By I mean, weight, yeah. It's almost, you can't even believe. It's not even that far away. Yeah, yeah, exactly. You can't even believe, like, we have to stop this because the, the plastics are ending up on our dinner plates mm. because the fish are eating them. And all these plastics attract every pollutant in the water, from PCBs, flame retardants, oils, everything. Oh, really? Because they don't, they don't like just free floating. They have to yeah, cling yeah. to something. Uh -huh. And then the fish eat those things, and they're 100,000 to a million times more toxic than the surrounding waters. Because they oh all gosh, gravitate. I never even thought about it. Yeah, that. so it's like, um, you know, the fishing aggregate um, devices, except they're teeny, teeny little things all throughout the ocean and uh, they're very, very toxic. And so that's a real cutting edge form of uh, uh, field in science right now, yeah. studying those plastics and the chemicals that are getting in the fish and getting in you know, our, our seafood. Are there some other areas uh, in the world or around the country that have you know, bit, gone past styrofoam and stopped yeah. using it? Yeah, France just announced that they will um, ban all you know, uh, plastic and styrofoam disposable items by 2020, uh, 2020. yeah, okay. coming up very soon. Right. So that's going to be a real, I think, milestone for a lot of nations to look because, you know, there are studies being done right now that show, you know, we spend, I mean, millions and millions of dollars just cleaning it up, just the Department mm. of Transportation, you oh, know, really? plastic bags um, on Oahu because there's that loophole in the law that allowed the thicker plastic bags, which are even worse than the ones before. So we're working to close that loophole, but plastic bags and styrofoam, you know, are just 
everywhere and people had to clean this up and they don't realize that it actually costs millions of dollars it clogs storm drains causes floods and i gave a talk at the united nations uh in costa rica um, about this issue and there was an issue that i didn't even think about that it's also a perfect breeding ground for mosquitoes and so they had zika outbreaks Mm -hmm. in costa rica and so we have to be careful because we've had dengue on the big island Mm -hmm. And so, you know, these are, plastics are the perfect breeding ground because they hold that water, water, you know, even on the side of the road or in a ditch or in a stream, and that's where they love the perfect breeding ground. Let me interrupt you for a minute, Stuart. I'm here with Stuart Coleman of the Surf Rider Foundation at the Ruderman Roundtable, and we'll be right back after a short break. Aloha, I'm Kaui Lucas, host of Hawaii is my mainland every Friday here on Think Tech Hawaii. I also have a blog of the same name at kauilucas.com where you can see all of my past shows. Join me this Friday and every Friday at 3 p.m. Aloha. Aloha, my name is Josh Green. I serve as Senator from the Big Island on the Kona side and I'm also an emergency room physician. My program here on Think Tech is called Healthcare in Hawaii. I'll have guests that should be interesting to you twice a month. We'll talk about issues that range from mental health care to drug addiction to our health care system and any challenges that we face here in Hawaii. We hope you'll join us. Again, thanks for supporting Think Tech. Hello, I'm Marianne Sasaki. Welcome to Think Tech Hawaii, where some of the most interesting conversations in Honolulu go on. I have a show on Wednesdays from 1 to 2 called Life in the Law, where we discuss legal issues, politics, governmental topics, and a whole host of issues. I hope you'll join me. Welcome back. I'm State Senator Russell Ruderman from the Puna and Kau districts on the Big Island here at the Ruderman Roundtable on Think Tech Hawaii. I'm here with Stuart Coleman of the Surfrider Foundation. He's the Hawaii manager of the Surfrider Foundation, as well as an author. We were talking about uh, things that pollute the ocean and what can we do about it. Tell me, you have a new initiative. We were just talking about uh, styrofoam and reducing waste. You have a new initiative, I think, called the Ocean Friendly Restaurants. Yeah. Can you tell me a little bit about that? Sure. We have uh, we had an existing program called Ocean Friendly Gardens, mm. where we're working with. Uh, individual homes and and businesses and even schools larger to um, stop runoff from going into you know just simple things you can do in your yard by creating bioswales and collecting rainwater and just these little things that can save so much water get it recharged into the ground mm. recharge our aquifers for you know our water supply and then also reduce the amount of stormwater runoff which is the number one source of pollution so that was so successful that we, we were thinking, you know, we've been trying to reduce the amount of plastic pollution and, you know, people kept on saying, oh, you know, as you were saying, businesses can't afford this and they can't do this. And, you know, it's this old argument that, you know, we were talking about is just not true. And uh, so we formed uh, another kind of program called Ocean Friendly Restaurants. And we're working with restaurants around the state to certify them as ocean friendly if they follow, you know, certain criteria. Um, that you know reduces their plastic pollution, their plastic footprint, and also the amount of energy and water they use. Um, mm. And so we launched it uh, at the end of Earth Month, and uh, by now we have uh, almost 82 restaurants that we certified across the state. And so it's just really taking off. Well, that's great. And full disclosure, I'm a little bit aware of this program because uh, <laughs> the business I own in the Big Island has was received this award just in the last few days, actually. Yeah. We were very excited about it. And, uh, you know, we proudly display this, the sticker on the door. And tell me, how does a restaurant uh, become ocean-friendly qualified? What do they have to do? Yeah, well, we have on our website, oceanfriendlyrestauranthawaii.org, we have a, a place where you can nominate restaurants you know, once you see that they fulfill the criteria. And the first mandatory criteria are, you know, that there's no styrofoam, just because, as I mentioned, it's the least recycled and most toxic and most littered form of plastic. And then um, reusable uh, utensils on site, um, plates, cups, and everything. If you're going to dine inside, just, you know, so that they have that. Um, And then third is proper recycling, um, that they have 
uh, you know, proper recycle on there. So those are the mandatory ones. And then we have uh, other criteria such as no plastic bags for takeout mm -hmm. and, um, you know, straws only upon request. And, you know, they seem, it's funny because sometimes I think, oh, it's so small, people think it's a little bit of a pain. But, you know, those straws, just refusing a straws, we go through 500 million straws every single day in the United States. 500 million. 500 million. So you think about that. It's just, it's massive. That's a lot. And so just saying, you know, one of the restaurants is like, you're a restaurant, you have to serve your customers. If they want a straw, you give it to them, but just let them request. Yeah. Because most people can drink their water can do without it. fine without a straw. Yeah. So it's a, it's a great program. The businesses love it. The customers love it. And, you know, environmental groups love it. So it's really been this win win situation. And, what we're you know, hoping is to show that restaurants can do fine and stores like yours you know, not only survive um, not having foam and going through these practices, but are thriving. Yeah. yeah. Well, to toot our own horn for a minute, my, my company's called Ivy Naturals. We eliminated uh, things like styrofoam from the very beginning more than 18 years ago and have adopted the compostable utensils and containers. And, we have thrived all along, you know, and the customers appreciate it. It doesn't yeah. have a it doesn't have a noticeable impact on the bottom line, and it's the right thing to do. Yeah, and people are attracted to it, you know. Yeah. Like, but when I go to the Big Island, before I knew you or anything, and knew the you know the connection, it was like, oh yeah, we have to go to that store because I know the food is good. It's going to be you know mostly organic, and they're not going to have all this plastic waste. So. You know, especially for people who travel or people who are really conscious about where they eat and what they put in their bodies, you know, it's nice to have a list of these stores. We list all the stores, and we have a Facebook page also. Yeah. So if you're going out, you can say, yeah, let's, let's go and support with our money a place that, you know, we agree with their principles. So let's look at the other side of that coin. Print. Let's say you go to restaurants that are using styrofoam. Uh -huh. so what can a customer do? to encourage that restaurant to make that change. I mean, will this ocean-friendly restaurant be a, uh, you know, kind of a carrot that they can yeah. move for? Or exactly. Just... And that's what, you know, we tell our volunteers, because, you know, it's all volunteers going out and doing this, is, you know, it's just about education. So, you know, if, if they don't make it now, we have a lot of restaurants that are like, yeah, I want to do this. They're looking at the criteria and they think, oh, really? we're not there yet, but and I was like, yeah, just keep on trying, you know, and, or maybe try it for a month, you know, switching over and see what your customers oh, say. And, yeah. and so, yeah, we're just encouraging and trying to educate. And it's, it's nice to see those stores switch. And then yes. they say, like, yeah, no, I don't know what the problem was. <laughs> like, we're actually getting more business. People are happier about it. Yeah. Well, what a great idea. Just try it for a month. I mean, that's not scary. Yeah. Right? Because I don't think whatever, if and it leaks or it costs too much, we change our mind. Exactly, and you have companies like, you know, Sustainable Island Products and World Centric here, mm -hmm. you know, that we're working with and we're trying to do a program where, you know, we can offer them, you know, for the same price for, a, you know, a limited amount of time mm -hmm. just so they can make that just switch it, and, yeah. yeah, and see because um, if you've ever seen, you know, anything that comes in styrofoam, have you ever noticed that there's always like a bed of cabbage or wax paper on the bottom? Um, of like oh, a clamshell, yeah. Uh -huh. yeah, that's because they know, and you know, the absorbs the taste. Center, yeah, the, the yeah, yeah. Um, you know, all these federal reports have come out that it absorbs all the chemicals, uh -huh. and so you know, it's kind of protecting it. So just for your own good, for your own health, if nothing else, take a plate to the restaurant and ask them to put it on a plate or in a Tupperware dish or something, um, because the you know, I hate to say it and announce it on this program, but. 98% uh, of us have styrene in our bodies. Um, mm -hmm. You know, the EPA has, has done studies, and so it's, it's already in our systems, so we don't need any more of it. We need to get it out of our system. Now, have you heard any examples of restaurants being convinced to make this change by uh, customer pressure? Yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, we've, uh, we're working with, uh, you know, some restaurants right now, I'm not going to name them, but, you know, that are really popular and people keep on asking them and uh, so the requests matter they the listen they absolutely listen. Yeah, yeah and if you know if anybody can go to the website um, oceanfriendlyrestauranthawaii.org and download the brochures download the information take it to your favorite restaurant and say yeah, okay. i support you guys i want you, you know i want you to do this because it's good for you it's good for your customers it's good for the environment and their health yeah wonderful yeah so it's been fun 
Tell us, are, are you, we have a new water quality testing program on Oahu, is that right? Yeah. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, so we um, were uh, working with the Department of Health for a long time, um, and we helped get their funding initially to do water quality testing from the EPA through the Beach Act a um, long time ago, like 15 years ago. And uh, uh, maybe a little less than that. And uh, it, it was very successful, but then we just noticed that the numbers weren't getting out there, the water quality testing results people didn't know about. Um, and there were, we were doing our own water quality testing through the Blue Water Task Force. And especially in Kauai, we noticed there were, there were just chronically polluted beaches and they were not posted and the law says they have to have signs. You know, these are very, and some of them are very high, like you would not want your kids to go anywhere near this water. So we're talking um, about ocean water. Quality. Yeah, ocean water, and then the streams, especially the streams that feed into it. Um, in that area, that kind of tidal area, um, is is you know some of them are really contaminated. So, you know, the, we got the EPA involved, and now it's great. We're working with the Department of Health and Clean Water Branch to post warning signs and to do that kind of notification, public notification, and just you know we're going to try to get the lifeguards involved. So, like, it's just one of their signs, jellyfish. Mm -hmm. strong currents, mm -hmm. you know, undertow, brown water advisory, warning, don't go in, you know, there's, there's a high level of pathogens in the water. And um, so that's, that's the, the goal. And I think we've really come a long way. It's been a kind of a national effort and a regional effort and local effort and really successful. Tell me, before we, uh, before we finish through it, how can someone get involved with Surfrider Foundation? Our website is surfrider.org. And then um, if you want to look up the particular chapter's websites, you just put oahu.surfrider.org or kawaii.surfrider.org or kona.surfrider.org or hilo.surfrider.org. And let's say someone like me who's sort of a non-surfer, can anybody join? Absolutely. Yeah. That's probably the biggest misnomer about the Surfrider Foundation. We are <laughs> not a bunch of surfers. I'm a snorkeler. <laughs> we I welcome snorkelers, ocean, spongers, right. stand-up paddlers, yes. Okay. And a anybody who loves the ocean. Frankly, like, I'd say probably, you know, half, um, uh, a third to a half of our people don't surf actively. Really surf yeah. Okay. So it's just people are concerned about their coastal areas, you know, whether it's overdevelopment or... I'm glad we cleared that up. Yeah, exactly. I'm going to have to join and become a member. Yeah, I would love to well, have you. Thank you so much. We've been here with Stuart Coleman, the Hawaii manager of Surfrider Foundation. Here at the Ruderman Roundtable, we're here on Think Tech Hawaii every other Tuesday afternoon at 2 o'clock and available on the YouTube channel Think Tech Hawaii. Um, thank you very much for joining us. We'll be back in two weeks. Mahalo.